this was a few years ago. And based on that, I did a lot of reading and the Chart College of Teaching, which is a big group of teachers, um, come on up to ask me to join their assessment board to certify that teachers can use the postnominals of a chart of teacher. So I focus on the assessment module on that. Um, a little bit about the session, what it is and is not. It really isn't going to tell you what you need to do for your school. This session isn't really going to tell you um, everything I do with my school. I, the reason why I can't tell you what to do with your school is because your audiences might differ. For example, if you've got loads and loads of iPads, you can do something another school can't. If you've got a few children in the class, you can do something that another school can't. Um, so it's a bit rich when people say, uh, I've got your assessment solution. Because assessment solutions are really, really context dependent. Uh, but what this session is, is a quite brief overlook um, of pretty much fundamental measurement of what I do at my school, what different kinds of number systems there are. But I need to stress, it really is a brief uh, overview. Um, the first thing we're doing, we're going to route through, is, well, I'm going to talk to you, why enough are we testing anyway? Uh, it might seem obvious, but there are some uh, counterintuitive things, and the reason why we test. Um, and I'll tell you what the problems are when people misunderstand the purposes of assessment. That will be quick, that will be about ten minutes. And the rest of this presentation has been looking at well, what different kind of number systems are there. And how does my title, how does fundamental measurement work? Because contrary to popular belief, psych, um, a psychologist called George Roche solved this problem in the 1960s. You can measure psychological attributes, but it's a little bit more uh, difficult um, than you might first think. And then once we've looked at what is fundamental measurement, I give the real kick of stuff I'm doing in my school, um, what you can actually do. Um, I, this is really, really fresh data. In point, it, it literally is yesterday's data. I work with Jane over there, she's sitting over there. Uh, we go to the same school, and we just recently, we've just had to, in the last few days, put all our data together and give it to central, uh, the central school. So it is really, really fresh data. First thing we look at is why not we test it? We're testing not because I don't want to give a literal test. A literal test is asking someone, an army recruit perhaps, can you clean your gun? If they can clean your gun and you can see them clean the gun, it's fine. Yes, no, they can't. They can clean the gun or they can't. It's really, really obvious. That's a literal test. But you're not interested in literal tests. What you're really interested in are representational tests. Tests are, in school terms, a representational technique. What I mean by that is if you have five questions and they're about addition, you're not really interested about those five addition questions. You want to make a claim or a conclusion that's much wider than that. Or if they can do seven plus three, they can also do a question I didn't set. Six plus three, for example. So you're trying to get on a piece of paper, five questions, and it's supposed to represent the entire domain of the subject that you're trying to test. For example, if I asked you to do this question, this is a really easy question for you. For um, very small children, it might be more difficult. If for small children, this might actually tell a lot about uh, a small child. For an adult, it might not. Um, if you answer this question, which is the answer is one, um, what could you possibly claim? Could you claim that it can do every single addition problem? Could you claim they can do all fractions? Could you claim they can do when the denominators, numbers at the bottom, are the same? Could you also claim that it can do every single fractions problem when the denom uh, numerator, the top numbers, are one, are the same? What can you claim? And this claim is an inference, and an inference is in the wonderful words of Benjamin Wright. You, uh, from going, from what you have, you've got this answer, half plus a half equals one, and you've got it, but you really don't want it. You don't want to know whether they can do five questions. You want to know whether they can do all the questions you didn't set. So an inference is going from what you have, and but don't want. I don't want to know that you did half plus a half equals one. I want to go from what I have but don't want to 
I want. I want to know if you can do uh, three quarters plus two fifths. I want to know if you can do um, 7.5 divided by two, add or subtract uh, a half. I want to know that. I haven't asked you that question. So in a sense, an inference is going from what I have but don't want to, uh, to getting what I want but can't get. This is the fundamental issue of all testing because you're given data that you ultimately don't care about because you care about the questions you haven't been able to set. Um, so how on earth can you um, assign quality? Most people think, I'm oh, sorry David, I'm the usual uh, yeah. thing here. Most people think you get a piece of paper and it's got some questions on that thing, this thing has some quality to it. But the thing, the questions don't have quality. It's never about the questions that have an intrinsic quality but it's about the conclusions. When you're validating a test, or in other words, ascribing some, a sense of quality to a test, it's never about the instrument. It's about the conclusions you make from that instrument. And this is a big problem, because most people with poor assessment literacy don't get this. It's never about the thing. It's about the conclusions you, conclusions you draw. If the conclusions are solid, then that means a thing was solved. Um, we see this uh, erroneous thinking of the thing must be solid. It's the thing, the test that I give to my child must be solid. Erroneous thinking means that you can give it to an adult and you'll get the same conclusions. We just saw, if we thought a half plus a half was great for a child, it's not great for an adult. So it can't be the question that has quality. It's the conclusion you draw from it. And I'm interested in one conclusion. The interested, uh, I'm interested in the summative conclusion, or the summative inference, where a child is. There's obviously another inference, the formative uh, inference. But I'm really interested in the summative inference. Where are they? And this has perplexed teachers, oddly enough, um, to a point where the chief inspector of um, England and Wales, Amanda Spielman, recently said this. She wanted school leaders to be able to discuss, in the context of being held accountable for their performance, um, what they expect pupils to know by certain points in their life, and how they know they know it, and crucially what the school does when they find out they don't. And these conversations, she, she says, are much more constructive than inventing Byzantine number systems, which in her view, and sometimes, and let's be honest here, can be meaningless. I'm interested in four things when I read this paragraph. And this applies to Sweden too. The reason why it applies to Sweden, because these are very general statements about quality in schooling. Um, what, uh, when you ask any teacher, you're interested in what you expect your, uh, pupils to know, you're, you're interested in the teacher knows the children have got it, and you're interested in the teacher can make instructional next steps. But everyone that I've spoken to often forgets this last bit here, number systems. It's tapped on the end, it's something, oh, I'm not great at number, I'll tuck it in the end, and it's forgotten by. Uh, but I think that's really important. We get number systems right, it makes the other things a lot easier. And as I said, it works for the UK and Sweden. It's a very general framework. <coughs> this is a framework by Dylan William, the giant face of God that came up for about two minutes at the beginning. Um, for, this is a formative assessment. Find out where your learners going, where they are, then find out where they are, and then look at the gap and figure out how to get there. It turns out that Amanda Spielman's paragraph can be actually put straight into them about what you expect to know, how you know it, and what you do. It turns out that I'm not actually really interested in issues of curriculum yet. I'm not going to talk to you about what children should know. I'm not really going to talk to you about what you should do if they don't know it. I'm going to talk about this. How do you know you've got, they've got it? So, so far, we looked at why test. We test to draw conclusions. There are some problems uh, if you don't have the right frame, framework to think about assessments. Because in social sciences, what you think about the world 
influences what you look for. If what if your what you look for has been influenced, it influences what um, uh, interventions you put in place. Because if you have a particular belief about the world, it will affect what you do, and what you do will change children's lives. Some schools in the UK think that actually learning is pretty linear, and it goes up all the way, all the way through, it's nice and linear and straightforward. But if, 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 and so, at autumn, between autumn and spring, too far apart terms, and there's a gr we have a break in the middle in winter, suddenly the child has to go up a grade, which means that the most effective educational strategy for um, UK teachers to know is to let children stay in at home. Because if they automatically move up a grade, just let them stay at home and don't actually teach them. So we've been doing the wrong thing by actually teaching. That's what poor assessment literacy gets you. What you believe about assessment and learning affects what you do. We know learning isn't linear. We know learning isn't linear because um, there's some recent uh, research done by um, the Fisher Family Trust in the UK that they took um, some data on children who were very young at this start point. Most children at this start point get to that 34% at age 16. But look how many different ways they get there. Learning isn't linear, because in the wonderful words of Becky Allen and uh, Mark Treadway, more children get to the right place in the wrong way, they go like this, or they go like this, than they get to the right place in the right way. Learning isn't linear. Uh, assessment results aren't linear. So we need to honestly just believe that and do something about it. <coughs> if you really, really do believe that assessment is linear and um, you have a set of beliefs about assessment, then you run into some problems. And the problems are that people don't necessarily always have the tools to take into account the difficulty of an assessment. If I told you, can you tell me how an assessment is difficult, how would you know? Uh, there's an issue there. How do you do that? Um, people are very, find it very hard to take into account the ability of students. And everybody that I talk to in, when I've been um, <clears throat> as a colleague of, they don't realise that getting 75% in an assessment isn't twice as good as getting 35%. The reason why is because percentages are artificially constrained between 0 and 100 which means the infinite scale of ability has been whack, squashed. Taking an infinite scale and you're squashing it into a finite scale, which means the gaps between the percentages are different. It's the jump from getting 90, 90% to 91%, that's a 1% jump, that 90 to 91 is actually a way bigger jump than getting from 49 to 50. So when you go to a child, oh, by the way, to get really good in your exam, just get one more extra percent, but if it were that easy, I would have done it. Um, it's actually a much bigger jump if your child's already pretty good. And you have to then somehow absorb that. You have to absorb the fact that there are different size gaps between any sort of cut points you make. How on earth do you do that? Um, We've looked at why we're testing, we've looked at the problems, and now we're telling you how you do it, and it's about number systems. This part here is probably going to be the most important section of my talk, um, because I'll give you some references, you can take that away. Uh, once you take that away, you can read about it, and it ameliorates some of the problems I have about this being a very short session. Stevens, uh, a while ago, said there were about four levels of measure, nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. I have really big doubts that nominal uh, level is actually measurement, because what nominal is, is just labelling. Blue, red, green, that's, that isn't measurement to me. Um, he made a, I personally believe that's a big flaw. But just labelling things, you're not measuring them. Um, Another uh, level of measurement, getting steadily more complex, is the ordinal level of measurement. Here, the order matters. I am shorter than David. Jane is shorter than me. She smiles. Um, the order matters. And I don't really care about the difference. I just care about this being better than this, and this being better than this, and this being better than this, and that being better than this. We've had um, 20... 
10% uh, of all the talks here today are about this is better than this and this is better than this, which is comparative judgment. Uh, that's a big feature of today, which is oh, yeah, that is really, really great. Um, so today, actually, what we're going to do is this is better than this, this is better than this. We're going to look at the underlying maths and what makes it actually possible. Um, because uh, sometimes people take comparative judgment and adopt it without criticism, without critique. This enables you to engage with that critique. To get you across the idea of ordinality, here I've got a question. And unfortunately, we've really uh, spread apart, but here's a question. A block of metal is at zero degrees. And I'm just going to make this block hotter. I'm going to make it twice as hot. What's the temperature of this block here? <laughs> You don't have to commit to an answer. I'm not going to ask you publicly to commit to an answer, but commit in your head. That way, when you get the answer, you go, I at least haven't shouted it out. So all I need is a little nod from you publicly, inside your head, committed to an answer. Yeah, so we come to the pub inside our head, we commit to an answer. Uh, David, is it, z is it zero degrees Celsius? Twice as hot, zero, zero? Well, it can't be, can it? It can't be. That's what a basic understanding of multiplication would yeah. lead you to believe. So two times zero is zero is twice as hot. Well. What do we have to do? Anybody, anybody does science over here? What would you have to do? I think you need to convert to the Kelvin system. Yeah, we need to convert back to the Kelvin system. The Kelvin system has an absolute zero, the coldest. It has a meaningful zero. <coughs> this Celsius scale is a ordinal scale. It only tells you uh, things are hotter than the other things, but, the, um, but it's more than just an ordinal scale. The gap between one degree and two degrees is the same as the gap between 90 degrees and 91 degrees. This is an interval scale. Celsius is an interval scale. The differences between the values are regular, and Kelvin has a meaningful zero point. We can talk about multiplication. We can talk about multiplication with ratios. We can talk about addition and subtraction, <coughs> progress, uh, with the interval scale. We can't really talk much about the ordinal or the nominal. But I'm going to give you a technique that takes ordinal data and converts it into interval data, which is what comparative judgment does. It looks at the comparison and converts those comparisons into equally spaced units called logits. Logits are log odds. We're going to be using the Roche model. This is the most important slide in this presentation because this is the first time I give away the money. The Roche model is incredible. It's the first time I read about it was a few years ago, and it blew me away. And it must have blew George Roche away when he sat down on his own trying to solve, he was given by um, a contractor to solve the educational problem of testing. So he went out on his own and didn't really know, because he was kind of a recluse and not really talked to him, he didn't really know what was happening elsewhere. He said, it must be, so he sat on his own, did it, but like, done it, like, I solved it. And everyone was like, no, you haven't solved it. Social science is really difficult. You haven't, you haven't, you haven't. It's like, yeah, yeah, I have, I've solved it. We, we sold educational measurement for the last, like, to the 1960s. Um, so I'm going to speak about the Roche model, and I'm going to tell you how this fundamental measurement works. <coughs> what you do, and it's beautiful, is you have a continuum. Easy. Hard. Question one is harder than question two. But I can do something with the Roche model no other thing can of my responsibility. I can put people on the same scale. The Roche model doesn't differentiate between people and questions. So now I can look at this and go, hmm, Alice is in between questions one and two. That means Alice has a bigger than 50% chance of getting question two correct. You're not dealing with absolutes anymore, you're dealing with probabilities. And that is the lot of a teacher, dealing with probabilities. Mm. And um, question one is higher than Alice, so that means that Alice has a less than 50% chance of getting question one correct. 
if the question and the person's ability, the difficulty of the question and the person's ability are perfectly aligned, then, well, it's 50-50 whether you're going to get it. You either get it or you don't. <clears throat> then you can do it for a whole class. Boom. I know Carl is going to find question two really difficult and go for one really difficult. Bob is going to find question two so easy. Alice is going to find it easy, but a little bit harder than Bob. I can see ahead of time which one questions my children will struggle with. And it gets even better because I can start to break apart questions. What do you get in 5A and 5B and 5C? If I see children move, Carl, oh wait a minute, Carl suddenly jumps up. He literally made progress because he can answer more difficult questions. His probability of answering difficult questions might increase. This is the Roche model. The Roche model allows you to literally make this diagram. Just, uh, there is a software that you can literally, it comes with the actual book. It's in the back and it's beautiful. It carefully guides you through. It gives you loads of tutorials. There's only one equation in this book. And it's right at the beginning, and it's an addition equation, and they never say another equation again. It's all words. It's the best book on the Roche model, I think, that's ever been written. It's so easy to understand. This is a little bit more technical. It's a nice, it's a hundred pound book, a little bit more technical. The Roche model, and particularly the software that comes along with the first book, allows you to do this within, and it blew me away, within three minutes. Imagine that for an assessment, it just comes up. What can I, I can do some magical, wonderful stuff. This is some magical, wonderful stuff that I can actually do. My school, Heston Community School, what we use it for is to link foundation and higher tiers. What those tiers are, if I have a wide group of uh, students, some students I know are not quite there yet, so I give them an easier version of this. Uh, assessment, a foundation tier. So you're my special kids. Um, and there's some children that need to have a little bit more ahead and they get a harder version. But I give both of you a set of common items. So you both do the half plus a half question. So we've got some common items for both groups. So um, your foundation lot will do this many questions and your higher lot will do this many questions. Right now, in loads of schools in the UK, you've got these two separate assessments, and heads of department are looking at these two separate assessments and not statistically combining them together, just guessing, yeah, yeah, that will be that, we'll cap the grades, we'll cap learning at this level, and we'll divide by this, we'll look at the distribution. That is so wrong, because what you're doing is you're enforcing a distribution onto the data. It's like you're forcing, you are forcing this to happen. When you force what must happen to the data, you get the answers you sought. So what was the point of doing what you just did? When it turns out that you actually link the assessments together, put them on a common scale, what we found out was this. Uh, this is what I did uh, to my head of department on a Sunday evening uh, from 6 o'clock in the evening to 2 a.m., 72 pages. She's seen it. It's uh, a horrendous waste of my time. Uh, what we found is that if you give an experienced teacher two assessments, the easy test, the hard test, the common items, the easy test students get overestimated. The hard test students get underestimated. Why? Because if you get a high score in the easy test, you go, oh, you did so well. That's so lovely of you. We're going to give you a high grade. If, you get, if there is a um, higher harder test student, can they get a low grade? No, you are a higher test student, you should be getting higher than that, we're going to peg you down. It turns out, higher tier students, and I've seen all the data, uh, analysed all the data from my school, higher tier students are always pretty much underestimated. And foundation tier students are always, almost invariably, overestimated. The Roche model now allows me to do this very quickly. I can do the exact same thing with Alice and Bob, uh, but combine them. I, that means that this assessment is actually very well targeted. This gives you amount, the amount of. There's a lot of students at the same level of questions. There's a lot of easy questions here. There are some very hard questions, that very thin black bar, that a lot of all my students just have a really low probability of getting. So my interventions, I'm going to focus on those. 
but I also know there's a little bit of a student just right near the top on the left hand side that actually has a pretty solid chance in the hard questions. Imagine for every single assessment you do, you're given this sort of map, a probability distribution, pick a kid and see if their probabilities change or not. That's one thing we do at my school, we use it to link easy hard tests so I can make claims about two tests, uh, two, uh, two classes that are joined up together, perhaps taught by the same teacher. I also use the Rashomon to suggest defensible statements and honest statements. You've seen this diagram before. It's the same diagram, comes out of comparative judgment for the axis has been switched over. It goes from low ability to high ability. Whenever you see this kind of shape, you know the Rosh model item response theory is involved. I can instantly tell you that this child has a 63% probability of being around this probabil uh, ability. And notice, unlike other test theories, notice how wide the bars get. They change for each student. You've got an error estimate for each student, which means I can make really good claims about grouping. I know that those two children there should not be in my class. They should be elsewhere. But look at the error bars for every other single child. They almost all overlap each other to an extent. So I should really keep those kids in my class. What happens, unfortunately, teachers don't see the error bars when they get data. They see the dots and they focus on the dots rather than the spread of possible data. The Rush model allows me, any uh, item response theory model, allows me to generate these error, um, error bars. And here's the kicker. This is what I did yesterday. Um, I can use the Rush model to measure progress defensively. And use that word quite <coughs> I'm not saying I have measured progress. I am saying I probably measured progress better than someone else has. I can defend my point of view. If you've got a piece of paper and a pen, it's going to be a nice time to take it out because I'm going to get you to do some quizzes. Here are um, five of my students, Adam, Eve, Charles, Darren, and Fred. I gave them an assessment in October and I gave them the same, not the same assessment, but an assessment testing the same stuff in December. Adam got 18 in October and got 21 in December. Which students, again, either publicly commit in your, shout out to me, or, public, or privately commit in your head, which students should, be, should I be worried about? If you want me to do an operation like a multiplication or subtraction, just tell me that you want to do a subtraction. Which students should I, should I be most worried about? Frederick, because Frederick actually has the biggest, uh, actually the smallest jump. He's only gone up in two marks. Um, Eve, oh, 21 marks she's gone up by. But is this sensible to do it this way? Why is it not sensible? This is where public commi uh, uh, co uh, <laughs> commitment is really useful. You don't know the percentage. You don't know the percentages. So a lot of schools in the UK are now going, let's just do percentages. Let's just do percentages. So that was their percentage in October, percentage in December. I'm going to do the subtraction for you. Which, uh, which student should you, you should you be worried about now? Publicly commit either to me or privately commit on a piece of paper on your head. That's absolutely fine. I had Charles Diana Frederick. Pardon? I had Charles Diana Frederick. Yeah, so all the red ones they should be worried about. Um, but that's just percentages. But how well did the class do as a whole? What happens if the entire class got um, the, most of the class, except I've just selectively sampled? What happens if everyone got Eve's score of 90%, except for Frederick, Diana, Charles, and Adam? It turns out that actually that's a real worry. What happens if actually the average was 10% in the second assessment? And actually, you shouldn't worry about any of them because they got way above the average. So what some people are now asking in the UK is to standardise the scores. <coughs> so I standardised them and I used, and I forced the average to be at 100 and I made the standard deviation as 15. So if you understand IQ, like 130 is really smart and 75 is not so much. Um, 
I've used the same scale. So you can compare it like that. So you can go look here, 122 all, that's really above average um, Diana is for the first assessment. Which student should you be worried about now? Do you want me to do a subtraction? Yeah, I could do a subtraction. That's what I get. Which student should you be worried about now? Okay. And by how much? Can you go back before you do the subtraction? Yeah. I apologise if there's a... No, no. So... So here, what I've done for October, I have just October's data, I've standardised their results. Just that data. So this is based on the average for October's test. So and 100 will here be the average for September, December's test. So Diana and Adam are outliers. Uh, so Diana, Adam, outliers, uh, definitely. Because Adam, in the first assessment, scored 18. And Diana, uh, for the second assessment, scored, um, for the first assessment, sorry, scored 35. That's the first assessment. I'm doing the subtractions. Um, you have to do second minus first to give you the overall difference. So in the first assessment, uh, Diana scored 35, that's why she's 122, she's quite far away from everyone. In the first assessment, Adam scored 18, that's why he's actually quite got low standardised score. It's taking into account the average of the class. Most people, then, would do subtraction. And this is where they'll go, they'll go, okay, Eve is absolutely fine. We're definitely worried about Adam because he's lowered in the rankings of the class. He's falling in the rankings. Oh no, Charles is falling in the rankings too. Diana's falling in the rankings too. Frederick is falling in the rankings too. But that's a bit weird. We had one conclusion when we did this, another conclusion when we did this, and another conclusion when we did this. Just getting more and more data has altered our conclusions. And there are massive problems with just looking at raw scores, massive problems with looking at percentages, and massive problems by looking at standardised um, scores and just subtracting them. I can't do subtraction here. This is not an interval scale. This is not an interval scale. This is not an interval scale. So what the hell do I do? You've got a very poor signal to noise ratio. Yeah, I've got a bit it's horrible. It's it's not even if I can even get better data, even if I get better tests, it's still the wrong thing to do. Because none of them allow for subtraction. At Heston, we go, okay, in the first assessment, Paul is at eight locates. That's the mm -hmm. units that used in uh, the Roche model. The locate is a unit of ability. Top of the arrow, lots of locates. Bottom of the arrow, not many locates. So you might naively assume I use the, use the Roche model and I say pause at eight units in the first assessment and pause at 11 units in the second assessment. You think pause got better, but actually every single time with, new, uh, with another assessment and you run the Roche model with a new set of assessment, it's not on the same scale. The Roche model, model does give you equal spacings you don't know what those spacings are. So, in the first assessment, Paul was here. In the second assessment, Paul was here. Can you really make a judgment that actually, wait a minute, initially just eight, 11 bigger than eight, and wait a minute, actually no. What you need to do is put both of these scales on the same scale. This is what comparative judgment does with the anchor items. It makes the two different things you did on the same scale. So that's what I've done at my school. I put them on the same scale, and then you get this statement. Paul's at eight logits in the first assessment, and then Paul might be at nine logits when you translate the second scale into the first scale's uh, units. So should I just not worry about how to do that and accept that there's technology that can yeah, do it for it, it, it literally, you press a button, it's all done for you. Right. Um, However, there's people who know that, no, it's not that easy because there's whole things of uh, differential item um, functioning. Yeah. There is uh, issues of misfit, uh, misfit. there's issues of dimension, uh, dimensionality, there's issues of are there other components pulling the Raj dimension away. Um, you've got to be very, very careful. 
Um, so this again is a brief, brief overview. You can just press a button. Many researchers do press that button. Don't go quite so far <coughs> as to look at the nitty gritty. Um, and it's one of my main objections of reading Rosh papers. They just the uh, discussion about um, is it the right thing to do is never really quite big. It's quite small. Oh, we've done a couple of statistics and it's done, done, done. It should actually be much larger. Perhaps that's a conversation for another um, another time. Uh, sorry, another talk. But you can do this. Only when you put things on the same scale are they actually meaningful. So I've done that. I put them on the same scale and I calculate the difference on the same scale and I get this. Oh, this was rubbish, this was rubbish, this was rubbish. But on the same scale, every single child, I don't really have to worry about because every single child has made actual progress. It was silly of me to do the subtraction because this level of data does not support subtraction. This kind of data doesn't support subtraction and this level of data doesn't su support subtraction. But interval level data does. Were we take into account these are error bars? Is yes, not that was, um, actually progress? Um, one of the things that I haven't put here Okay that I put previously was the, oh. the error bars. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I acknowledge that there is some error there. Um, there was for this, because I didn't want to overwhelm the entire Excel document. Okay. Um, there were students, Steve, for example, she's so far apart from everyone else, and there was like at least six children that were really far apart, um, the error bars included, that I could make defensible claims. Here, so, so these two actually yeah, overlap. Yeah. Can I just check, is it, is it still reasonable to be concerned about Adam? Is it still reasonable to be concerned about Adam? Yes, yeah, because right. Good. Um, if actually everyone else has progressed by one logit, then he hasn't progressed fast enough. Yeah, yeah. He's... So yeah. my ending bit here is once we're able to do this, yeah. what kind of questions now can we confidently ask? And go. It's an appropriate question to uh, appropriate yeah, question to ask. Oh, now, some tutoring outside of class. Yeah, this isn't tutoring outside of class, or it could be this. And um, I haven't even begun to explore the level of data you can get out. You can look at response patterns. You can actually spot guessing and spot unexpected items. It is just amazing that uh, just George Rush in the 1960s on his own just did most. Actually, not him alone. There's Lucy and two people. Um, they did a lot of work. And they kind of solved it. We have got measurement in the social sciences, but the conditions for this measurement are actually quite stringent. You can't just give any old assessment. You have to give assessments that support uh, a single dimension. Just like in comparative judgment, looking at quality and that uh, dimension is a single dimension. You don't look at quality and handwriting and this and this and this. You have to ensure that your assessments assess a single dimension. And if you have many dimensions, then... You still might have validity noise. Pardon? You still might to have validity noise. Yes, you will still have issues of, am I assessing what I want to assess? Are my conclusions 100% um, warranted from the data? Yeah. Um, that's a official hazard of assessment experts. Yeah. And it's been 100 years, and no one still has been nailed what validity is, despite there being like four, uh, four editions of educational measurement. Uh, to point some researchers like Paul Newton going, can we just stop using it and use some quality instead? But then it gives another issue entirely. Um, so there's a whole sort of weird thing with the assessment community. It's a bit incestuous. Does this, is this built on the ability to say whether a question, which question, in the order of difficulty of questions? Yeah, so hidden in beneath it is an idea where you get the whole set of data every single child, 1010, 1010, 1010, four marks, three marks. Um, you can do what's called a scalagram. A scalagram orders your children of, uh, it orders from easy to hard and then uh, questions and then students and that give you a particular pattern. Um, again, I can't explain that in a huge amount of detail because he's just about to put a um, thing up. But does the system do it or does a teacher, somebody creating the assessment have to say this question is harder than Oh, the system does it for you because it calculates the... So it works for every problem the student's responses. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. it's just beautiful, it's wonderful. It's an argument of getting every single student's, uh, every student's response. 
um, it's taken, the child has got this right and this wrong, wrong, right, or writer, and right and wrong, ordinal data, right is better than wrong, it takes ordinal data and it's now taken that and made it into integral data. So even, even if, so what it's basically telling you that, that even if the child got it right, it's still calculating the probability that they won't get it right again. Yeah, uh, not right again. Um, there's like a philosophical issue with that statement. Well, it, okay, so when we think about the literal if, and the representation. Yeah, the if, data, if yeah. the child did questions like that yeah. an infinite number of times, the probability of getting it right would be this. It's very similar to how classical test theory does it. Doesn't it? Very, you have to say it in the right way yes. for it to be technically accurate and okay. it's a pain. It really is a pain, the assumptions. Um, Hopefully this has been really useful to you. Um, I'm going to leave that there. Um, I know it's been quite a whirlwind, um, but if I were to say anything, I would probably say the one thing to look at would be uh, these two here. This is heavy going. This is probably one of the best books I've read that introduces the Welsh model effectively, because it can, psychometrics can be a bit daunting. Um, if you've got any questions, I'm more than happy to answer it um, and have a go at it because this is a, someone's really interested in it and wants to have a go at it. Uh, any questions? Also, by the way, the whole order on other data into interval level data, it's not always perfect. You never always get interval level data. You might get them slightly spread apart, but it's as close as the interval as you're going to get. Um, so that's, it, there are limitations. You know the progress you have on the right, the progress on the right, that plus, can you identify if it's like normal progress that you'd expect a child to do, or can you identify this because of? That is my whole next year, is to get a series of norms and expectations, because ultimately everything we do is a comparison to get something else. If I want to know that it's okay, I need to know what okay looks like, and we've defined as human beings that okay is what every, what the average does. It's silly. It could be okay. It might be what some particular people are doing right now. Um, any more questions? Okay. I, can I just double check this because I, I feel a bit stupid. But, but all I would practically have to do is within the the, the software feed in the test items and the student yeah. okay. whether they got them right or wrong. And That's all I'd have to do. Literally, with it. for the software. <laughs> It's, um, insert, it's no, Excel, press it, press the button, says Excel, put your file in, and you're done. It does it all for you, you get loads of... Uh, but you, you've got to have, you can't, you can't just have a raw, it's got to no, be item response. No, you can't be raw scores. You can't just feed raw scores and raw total scores in. It's got to be item response. It yeah, all, yeah, it's yeah. got to be the items, because yeah. you care about the items, you don't care yeah. about the old thing. Yeah. If you, that was the case, you can give them anything you want. You care about items. Uh, any more questions? Um, to leave, um, there are limitations. The limitations are fully explored, as well as they could be in this book, and better explored here. Please don't take my word for it. Please question and harangue. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.